Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. With me today, Ward Connerly. I begin because it's relevant to our discussion with your ancestry. Ward Connerly is of African American, Irish, French, and Choctaw heritage. Have I got that right, Ward? That's right. He is a businessman, a former regent of the University of California, and the founder and chairman of the American Civil Rights Institute. He is also the author, most recently, of Lessons from My Uncle James, Beyond Skin Color to Content of Character. In 1995, Mr. Connerly got on the ballot, campaigned for, and achieved the enactment of Proposition 209, intended to make it illegal for the state of California to discriminate on the basis of race. The proposition, in other words, was intended to, act, to end affirmative action by the state. The proposition passed. Since then, Mr. Connolly has won the passage of such measures in Washington State in 1997 and in Michigan in 2006. He has attempted but failed in efforts to place such measures on the ballot in Florida, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Arizona. Got that right? This year, 2008, the election a month away as we shoot, Mr. Connolly is supporting anti-preference ballot measures in Colorado and Nebraska. Which brings us to segment one. The central language in both the Colorado and Nebraska measures, quote, the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting, close quote. Where does that language come from? The 1964 Civil Rights Act. I see, all right. Now, Ward, when Coloradans go to the website of Vote No on Proposition 46, uh, excuse me, Amendment 46, which is what it's called in Colorado, they will find themselves greeted by a video of the president of the Colorado Senate, Peter Grof, who is an African American. Let me read you a couple of quotations from this video by the president of the Colorado Senate and ask you to respond. Quote, Amendment 46 is brought to us in Colorado by a California millionaire named Ward Connerly who wants to put his ideology into our Constitution. How do you reply? Well, it's not my ideology. It's the, um, I think, the view of most Americans that all of us should be treated equally by our government. And it's interesting to me that those who oppose uh, measures such as Amendment 46 um, rarely debate the issue. They rarely go to the language of the initiative and tell people why they think it's wrong, uh, why they, you know, why they are supporting preferences essentially. I'm always willing to debate the issue, but our opponents, without exception, don't go to the issue. They attack me, or they call me a park carpetbagger, or they uh, say that I'm trying to impose my will on the state. I'm not on the ballot. Uh, the language is, and I think that the uh, voters of, of Colorado and Nebraska will vote in favor of How do, those I measures. Just, I just, to get, what do you have to do to get this measure on the, the Colorado ballot? That's a question of gathering signatures? It's a question of gathering signatures, and we had to gather 117,000, I think it was, valid signatures to get on the ballot. All right. And those 117,000 are not California millionaires. They're not California They're maybe millionaires. Colorado millionaires. Or even, Cali or or even California poor guys, you know? <laughs> All right. Uh, Peter Grof, the Senate president in Colorado, once again, quote, Amendment 46 would eliminate hundreds of programs that help level the playing field, giving qualified women and minorities a fair chance to compete, close quote. What about this hundreds of programs? Is that true? There may be hundreds of programs. Uh, the problem always is that you can rarely identify the programs because the universities and government agencies will say, we don't give any preferences. I mean, there, there, there are no race preferences here. There are no quotas. Uh, we're just trying to level the playing field with equal opportunity. So if the amendment passes, if Amendment 46 passes in Colorado and the parallel amendment passes in Nebraska, what happens if the state agencies and uh, public institutions such as the University of Colorado are, are going to do their best to engage in a, in a, in a kind of head fake or, or dodge it by saying, oh, well, we were never in the business of racial preferences in the first place. 
is, is it the operative effect of the passage that it gives private citizens uh, grounds on which to sue these institutions? Yes, and that's, that's the way it will unfold. They will say before the election that we're going to devastate their uh, equal opportunity programs. After the initiative passes, they will say, we, ju we can just do a little fine tuning here and there and we will be in compliance. We, uh, our organization and the Pacific Legal Foundation and others, will be on them like white on rice to make sure that they are in fact complying with the, with the right. new law. From Colorado to Nebraska briefly. When Nebraskans go to the website of Nebraskans United Together for Opportunity, they will learn that your effort in the state of Nebraska is opposed by, quote, I quote the website, Nebraska faith groups, business groups like the o Omaha Chamber of Commerce, educational institutions like the University of Nebraska, and grassroots organizations like the League of Women Voters. You have attracted the opposition of churches and synagogues, the Chamber of Commerce, the University of Nebraska, and the League of Women Voters. Why would such mainstream organizations in the very heartland of America oppose such a measure? I think the establishment is always at odds with the people on issues involving race. They're always at odds. I mean, in Michigan, Washington State, California, were it not for Pete Wilson in California, we would have had the former same governor. former governor, right. same cast of characters that opposed us. But the people, they don't care. Uh, Colin Powell was against us in all three of those states. Barack Obama was against us in Michigan. The voters don't care about that. All they know is that they believe in the principle of fairness. And I predict that in Colorado and Nebraska, they will do the same thing here. All right. Segment two. What has happened here in California since the passage of Proposition 209? It's enacted. The voters approved Prop 209 in 1995. It gets held up in various court battles. So the first year, as I understand it, in which it was thoroughly in effect was 1998. Now, let me quote to you, if I may, from a study by the office of the president of, university, of the University of California. We're taping this at Stanford. Stanford is a private institution. Prop 209 doesn't apply. University of California, a state institution, Prop 209 does apply. Quote, uh, the, the year 1998, the first year in which Prop 209 took effect, in that year, the proportion of underrepresented students in the admitted class, that is, African Americans, American Indians, and Latinos, dropped on every campus and by more than 50% at UC Berkeley and UCLA, to name the two members of the UC system with the highest uh, admission requirements. So you supported a measure that cut the proportion of African American and Hispanic students at the two most prestigious institutions in the UC system in half. I supported How a How can you live with yourself? Yeah. <laughs> I supported a measure that brought the principle of equality to the state of California and that uh, ended the discrimination against Chinese kids and Vietnamese kids who were excelling in, in their studies over blacks and Latinos and Native Americans. Uh, I supported a proposition that a year later, after that first year, resulted in more black kids and, and uh, Latinos being admitted in the overall UC system. Uh, not to Berkeley and UCLA or to San Diego and Santa Barbara, the most selective ones, mm -hmm. but in the overall system, the numbers went up because there was that shakedown of students that had been previously allocated to campuses where they were not competitively admissible. And then after the preferences were over, they were going to campuses within the UC system where they were admissible and they were staying there longer and they were graduating at higher rates than they were before preferences uh, were ended. Okay, let me quote to you from that report by the Office of the President of the UC System one more time. This is a longish quotation, but it raises a couple of points to which I'd like to hear you respond. Quote, underrepresented students remain a substantially pr smaller proportion of those admitted than they were before the elimination of race-conscious policies. But these declines have been partially mitigated by programs designed to increase the enrollments of students from low-income families, those with little family experience with higher education, and those who attend schools that traditionally do not send large numbers of students on to four-year institutions, close quote. In the absence of programs explicitly based on race, they're saying, we in the UC system were able to jiggle around 
our admissions requirements and come up with programs that achieve something like the same ends, but were not based on race. Are they engaged in a major fiddle to work around Prop 209, or is this the kind of good and just action they ought to, be take, ought to have been taking in the first place? Uh, yes to all of your questions. <laughs> right. um, let me respond this way. The, the sad fact is that in the era of race preferences, UC was admitting, admitting middle and upper income black kids, giving them extra points. I mean, literally extra points. A new meaning to the term brownie points, okay? They were giving them extra points, discriminating against Asian kids and white kids in order to admit lesser achieving black and Latino kids. Once the preference era was over and UC began to adapt to um, comprehensive review as, as I had uh, led the way on that, those who were being admitted were lower income. There were kids whose parents had never gone to college. There were kids who were, going, who were attending underperforming schools. That's, that's really what affirmative action ought to be helping, those who otherwise okay. wouldn't be going to college. Okay. And, and that's who was being captured as a result of the change in the, in, the, uh, in the policies that were wrought by Proposition 209. So under race-conscious policies, you not only are the chairman of the American Civil Rights Institute, and you not only have engaged in a decade-long campaign to get these uh, to end uh, race preferences in state after state after state. You served for a dozen years as a regent of the University of California system. So you were privy to all the data and so forth. A 12-year sentence. A 12-year sentence. So your argument is that when they were able to craft admission policies based on race, there was a mad scramble in the UC system for black kids who could make it through all four years. And if they came from upper income black... In other words, they were tripping over themselves to get black kids who didn't really need help. That's right. And ignoring the black kids to whom they should have been reaching out in the first place. That's right. And now they can't play that game. That's right. All right. Not only black kids, but uh, Latino kids and Asian kids and white kids who are low income uh, and who ironically are achieving at a higher level than the middle class black kids were. Those are the ones who have benefited from this change. All right. Um, now, you mentioned this a moment ago. Let me repeat it. Although the enrollment rates for minority students in the UC system, the prestigious uh, schools in the UC system are down, the graduation rates for minority kids throughout the UC system are up. In some cases, fairly dramatically. In 1991, the four-year graduation rate for African-American kids in the UC system was 20%. Now it's up to uh, about 25%. In some cases, less so. The Latino graduation rate is up by a couple of points. Still up. What's going on? Tom Sowell talks about this in one of his books about the mismatch theory in which uh, government agencies, namely public universities, and I think private as well, in order to get this prescribed diversity, they take kids that would, be, that would do very well at Campus A, for example, that is a mid-level institution, and they give them extra points in order to go to Campus B where they really don't fit in because their campus B has a higher level of academic achievement. And as a result of that, the kids drop out earlier, they don't graduate. Uh, Richard Sander talks about this in his work uh, in connection with the law schools. The fact that um, this mismatch theory results in underperformance once they graduate. So what is going on is that once you remove that artificiality of race preferences, kids are going where they can compete. Segment three, the question of race itself and the experience of Ward Connerly. You were, a, you were born in Louisiana, spent your early childhood there, moved to Sacramento. Um, how much racial prejudice have you encountered in your life? On a scale of uh, 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest and 1 the lowest, I would say uh, probably a 4. So you felt it? I felt it, uh, especially during my earlier years. Bear in because mind. Because it was more prominent then or because you were just getting started? Then. More All right. prominent then. Uh, bear in mind that when my wife and I married in 1962, we uh, were almost breaking the law in every almost every state in this country because we were of different races. Um, 
we encountered that in housing. We encountered it when we'd go out to eat dinner and everybody would stare and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So it, it, was, it was enormous. But over the last uh, 20 years or so, very, very little. Uh, so if I segmented that into the first 30 years of my life and the last 39 years, I would say seven or eight in the first 30 and uh, one or two in the last 39. And you even that out at about a four. All right, about a four. Now, we, I said in introducing you, and I want to come back to it, uh, uh, your heritage or ancestry is African-American, French, Indian, no, fr French, Irish, and chalked American Indian. Mm -hmm. Ward, that's like hitting the affirmative action jackpot. You're able to check off, so for your children, for your grandchildren, what on earth are you doing whacking at affirmative action when you're able to pass on all these gifts of eligibility for this program or that program, minority business? Truly, what's, what, what's go, why don't you just quietly go along with the program, for goodness sake? It's in your interest and the interest of, of all your offspring. No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, because if, if one presumes that to have my skin color brown and to have the features of a, quote, black man, and uh, my ancestors, my kids, rather, who are all of me and all of their Irish mother, and uh, the two of them, their Vietnamese uh, mother, uh, if one presumes that those traits carry with, with them certain things about who they are, then one doesn't understand this country. Uh, I grew up in the Deep South. I was born in the Deep South. All my life I fought against the notion that my skin color suggested something about me. And it would betray everything that I believed in were I to change that in the last trimester of my life or even sooner and to say, yes, you're right. Race, we should be judged on the basis of race. I, I could never do more, more do that than I could shoot myself in the head. All right. On this program not long ago, I asked Shelby Steele, a friend of yours, I believe. Yes, indeed. I asked Shelby Steele about the so-called one-drop rule, the idea that anyone who has any black ancestry at all ought therefore to be considered black. And this, of course, we considered insidious when it was part of the Jim Crow system down south. But now everyone is referring to Barack Obama as an African American. He's half African American. His, his mother is white. And so I just asked in all innocence, Shelby, what, what do you make of this? Isn't this some kind of a, isn't it a throwback? Aren't you, aren't you conceding important ground if you concede that Barack Obama is African American? And Shelby said, if society treated him as an African-American, and it has because of the way he looks, then he's an African-American. So the question is, as long as society treats certain people in certain ways because of their physical features, and as long as those forms of treatment are negative, isn't it, isn't it a requirement for the government to step in to try to counter that sort of treatment? Well, what's, you're, what's you're, your position here? What? Your, your question is pregnant with a lot more questions. Yeah, well, go right ahead. Um, Do anything you want to with that word. First of all, I have, th th there are probably no two individuals in my country for whom I have more respect than Shelby Steele and Tom Sowell. Um, I know what Shelby is saying there. Um, Shelby is a, is a, is a, a captive of the one-drop rule himself, based on his own ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, what I think he is saying, however, is that it, it is pointless to argue for Barack Obama, Senator Obama, to argue, I'm white. I see. You see? I mean, yep, yep, he would be spending no every sense. moment of every waking day arguing with people who would say, no, my, my eyes don't deceive me. You're black. You're black. Right. So why argue it? That, that's the point. My position, however, is, yes, I understand what you're saying, Shelby, but I think we should argue it. I think we should contest this. I went to a, I gave a speech in Philadelphia once, and uh, I walked in, and this happened to be St. Patty's Day. And because of my own Irish background, I said, well, I want to get this over with so I can go out and march in the St. Patty's Day parade. And there are chuckles, and I purposefully said, why are you chuckling? You're chuckling at my ancestry. 
The point is that I don't look Irish, and because I don't look Irish, therefore I don't have the bona fides to claim right. that as part of my background. That's the dilemma that a lot of black people have in that society is unwilling to accept the reality of their, of their background, but rather looks at them and says, that's how you look, therefore that's who you are. And that is flatly unacceptable. It's flatly unacceptable. It is the one drop rule. Segment four, jurisprudence. Uh, I have a feeling that you'd agree that matters of race ought not to end up so often as in court, but they do. And because of this business you've been in with the American Civil Rights Institute of fighting to get ballot measures on uh, ballots in state after state, you have to pay close attention to what the courts are saying. Let me discuss a couple of recent court cases. 2003 case, Grutter versus Bollinger. The Supreme Court upheld the admissions policy of the University of Michigan, writing for the majority, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor argued that the Constitution, quote, does not prohibit the law school's narrowly tailored use of race in admissions decisions to further a compelling interest in obtaining the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body, close quote. And at that moment, it becomes the law of the land explicitly. Actually, it's a reaffirmation of the Bakke decision mm -hmm. in the 70s. But the Constitution permits distinctions based on race. And you respond to that how? The, the, the court, the, 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 the five in that decision got it wrong. One of the worst decisions in my lifetime. Uh, racial discrimination is against the law. Civil Rights Act of 64 says that we're all entitled to be treated equally, quote, without regard, without regard to race. So the court got it wrong. But the court always, when it comes to race, follows a policy of racial expediency. They do what they think is expedient to get us to the next horizon of dealing with race, and generally they do it in 25-year increments. Mm. The Bakke decision in 1978, the Grutter decision in 2003, and each time they narrow the use of race just a little bit, hoping that the problem will go away so that the next time they take it up, they can say, well, we finally solved that one. The four who said race should not be used had it right. And in the fullness of time, I think their position will clearly prevail. Okay. Well, let me bring you a little closer forward in the fullness of time. 2007, last year, Meredith versus Jefferson County Board. Now the Supreme Court strikes down integration plans in school districts in Seattle and Louisville that again used race explicitly. Chief Justice John Roberts, quote, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, close quote. And you cheered, presumably, when you heard that one. Absolutely. There the court is getting closer and closer to what I believe will be the decision. In fact, in 2003, Justice O'Connor, who cast the deciding vote in that Grutter case, said that we need to be moving toward race-neutral measures because the Constitution, um, the Constitution barely tolerates something that many of you want to enshrine in it, namely race preferences, her term, race preferences. Here would be, here, here's the underlying question. You've set it up. The court is moving in your direction, in the direction of what you consider right and just and latent in the Constitution in the first place. You'd, you'd agree with, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, Justice Harlan in 1896 who said our Constitution is colorblind. That's right. That's the correct position. Now, question. From 2003, they say, okay, a little bit of race is all right. 2007, they say, Chief Justice says, no. Now, is that just because a couple of seats got switched around or because the whole country, the whole legal establishment is moving in your direction? If the former, what's at stake in the presidential race? Could the election of Barack Obama set you back? Could the election of an African-American set back the cause of racial equality? Well, I think that the courts are a reflection a mirror of where society is on race. They don't follow the Constitution or follow any foundational principles. They kind of look up to the, hold a mirror up against society and say, where is society right now? And then they render a decision consistent with that. Senator Obama is moving in my direction as well. He talks about uh, when G uh, George Stephanopoulos, for example, asked whether his daughter should get race preferences, he said no. And he talks about socioeconomic affirmative action, not to uh, use that to supplant race, but rather to supplement it. I think right. he's wrong there.
But I think that his position is largely based on the fact that I don't care whether you're black or white. If you want to get the black vote, you have to support affirmative action. So I think that Senator Obama's position is more a reflection of electoral politics than what he really believes. And once elected, I believe that he will be moving more and more in my direction. And I think the courts will move there, regardless of uh, what the outcome will be of, of who is appointed to the court. All right. Segment five, our last segment. American ideals in the election of 2008. Let me give you two quotations from Martin Luther King Jr., 1963. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And we know that means a lot to you because of the title of your current book, Lessons from My Uncle James, and the subtitle is... Uh, beyond skin color to content of character. All right, so you're quoting Dr. King there. Martin Luther King, Jr., 1964, quote, whenever the issue of compensatory treatment for the Negro is raised, some of our friends recoil in horror. The Negro should be granted equality, they agree, but he should ask for nothing more. On the surface, this appears reasonable, but it is not realistic, close quote. It is at least arguable, if not demonstrable, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was moving toward affirmative action. What do you make of this? Well, I think that the best, um, the best way to look at this is to read a book written by Dr. King's personal confidant and lawyer, a man by the name of Clarence Jones. The book was called, What Would Martin Say? Mm -hmm. Just released a few months ago. Oh, really? And the question of what would Martin say about affirmative action was answered this way. He said, Martin would look around and see that a black man is on the verge of becoming president of the United States. He would look around and see blacks as secretary of, of state. He would look around and see all of the progress that has been made. And after seeing all of that, he would say, end it right now, talking about race preferences. End it right now. That's from his lawyer, from a man who was as close to him. He was also a speechwriter, I would add, for Dr. King. He knew the words of King. So I think that Dr. King would say, yeah, maybe it made sense for compensatory met methods back in the 1960s and 70s, but we're beyond that right now. And in his heart, Dr. King, who believed devoutly in the American Constitution, believed devoutly in the <coughs> Declaration of Independence and the principle of we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, he would be where I am on that issue. Ward, you yourself said a moment ago in the previous segment that whether you're Barack Obama or anybody else, if you want the black vote, you've got to embrace affirmative action. And now you're telling me that if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were alive today and there is no figure more revered in black America, very few in all of America, but certainly no figure more revered among black Americans than Martin Luther King Jr., he would oppose affirmative action. How do you make the case to African Americans that it's time for this to end? Martin Luther King was a great man. He was no hypocrite, and he believed in that principle, I, th I think, of equality, of equal rights for all Americans. And he would not uh, be afraid to go to, the, to black people and say, look, um, my, my, my people, it's time to move ahead. It's time to live out the true meaning of our creed. And uh, he would make that case. Unfortunately, there has been nobody like Martin Luther King to come along since then who has the stomach or the spine to say what must be said to black people, but it has to be said. All right, well that brings us to Senator Obama. Uh, you mentioned in an earlier segment his answer to a question from George Stephanopoulos on television a little while ago. Let me quote you Senator Obama's reply. He said, as you uh, mentioned, that his own daughters don't need affirmative action, but then he went on to say this, quote, I still believe in affirmative action as a means of overcoming both historic and potentially current discrimination, but I think that it can't be a quota system and it can't be something that is simply applied without looking at the whole person, whether that person is black, white, Hispanic, male, or female. What we do want to do is make sure that people who've been locked out of opportunity are going to be able to walk through those doors of opportunity in the future. Close quote. So what do you make of that? Is that just a politician wriggling around? It's triangulation. Trying to... All right. It's triangulation. Moreover, it's, it's unconstitutional. The only permissible use of race uh, that the court allows is for diversity. That's the only permissible use. 
all of this business about opening doors of opportunity and making up for the past and all of that, the court struck that down even in the Bakke decision. Curing societal ills is no longer an acceptable use of race, only diversity. And I'm shocked that nobody in the media has called out Senator Obama on that, on that argument. Flatly unconstitutional. So, looks to me, I've, I had the hook baited and ready to toss out here, but it looks to me as though you're not going to take it. I was going to say, so, Senator Barack Obama could, after the election, when he's no longer bound by such political exigencies, he could become a successor to Dr. King and say it's time for this to stop. But, but this kind of argument suggests that's not in his mind at all. He's changed before. <laughs> so I think that it's possible that he could, uh, uh, elected and looking at a second term, that he could change again. A couple of closing questions here. In every state in which citizens have had a chance to vote on them, that is in which you've managed to get your measures on the ballot in the first place, which is difficult. You have to gather signatures and then there are court challenges. People come down on you before you even get measures on the ballot, as I understand it. In every state in which you've made it to the ballot and citizens have been able to vote on these uh, anti-preference measures, they have passed, correct? Correct. Now, I want you to give me a prediction about what's going to happen in Colorado and Nebraska, but before that, does it bother you that you're getting white votes to pass these measures, and by and large, as best I can work it out, you're not getting black votes. Does that bother you that African Americans are not with you on this? Nope. Doesn't. Okay. A vote is now, a vote? I will, ex I will expand on it. Uh, we're all Americans. All right. We will see issues differently. Um, when people are invested in something and they believe that it benefits them, I don't care whether it's tax subsidies or farm subsidies, they're not going to give it up willingly. Black people aren't going to willing, willingly say, I don't want any more of that affirmative action stuff. Take it. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have had it in the first place. They're not, not going to say that. So decisions have to have, often have to be made contrary to what certain constituency groups might want. Okay. So you have no more concern in this regard than you would for John McCain going to Iowa and saying to the farmers, I'm going to end these ethanol subsidies. You won't like it, but I'm going to end it. It's just one more form of special pleading. Good, uh, good analogy. All right. Now, Prop 209 in California in 1996, as I recall, the vote was 58% in favor? 5545. 45. Give me the breakdown in Colorado. How's it going to do? 5842. Really? You're going to win that one pretty big. Mm -hmm. And Nebraska? 6040. 6040, no question. All right, Ward Connerly, good luck. Ward Connerly, chairman of the American Civil Rights Institute and the author of Lessons from My Uncle James. Beyond skin color to content of character. To beyond skin color to content of character. Thank you very much. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Thanks for joining us.